So a couple of weeks ago, we were in England and it was freezing cold and pouring with rain. And now two weeks later, we're in not so sunny Los Angeles where it is not really cold, but it's definitely pouring with rain. We're here at Boulevard Recording, the newly remodeled Boulevard Recording. Uh, Clay Blair, great friend, great engineer, great studio owner, had a fire um, about two and a half years ago now, I think. And he has fully restored the studio back to the way it was, which is absolutely amazing. And he has a brand new, well, vintage, but brand new Sound Techniques console to show off as well. So this is gonna be a lot of fun. Let's check it out. Clay, how the devil are you? How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Great to see you. I'm good, I was just uh, boasting about your sound technique, so. Absolutely. Why don't we start with that? Because I think it is kind of a central, central theme. It is. Absolutely gorgeous. Wow. There's not many of these in the world at all. In fact, there's only seven new sound techniques in the world. And this is the only one in a commercial studio. The original that they made uh, for the NAMM show, uh, I think back in 2017, still lives in Athens, Georgia, uh, at a recording school called Tweed Recording. Uh, and they have a couple studios there, but this this is the only one of its kind in a studio. And it is identical to the, uh, look at this. Look at that, there's the original one from 1970 in Studio A in Trident. So do you know a little bit about the the history that this is Kind of the, this is kind of a, a A range before an A range? A range before an A range. Yeah, so the original circuit for these were designed in the mid 60s, and there's actually a schematic that's dated in February of 67, and it says A range in quotations, which is before Trident even thought of making consoles. And these consoles were at Trident, as well as Delee Lane in both locations. Ah, oh, Delee Lane, yeah, of course. Sound Technique Studios in London, and also in LA, they were at Sunset Sound and Electra. So this is also unique because as far as I can tell, this is the only city in the country where Sound Techniques have been in studios. It's come home. It's come home. It's come home. Yeah, to absolutely. Be with Clay. Absolutely. We, uh, Clay had a little opening party a couple of weeks ago, just before NAMM. And we came here and put some signal through it. It's a beautiful sounding console. Absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, it's a work of art. Yeah. Absolute work of art. I love the way it looks. And they've gone to painstaking, you know, lengths to recreate not just the sound, but the look as well. Yeah. Everything you see is pretty much done by hand. I mean, with the exception of the circuits inside the boards and that kind of thing and the, and all of the screen printing and, and that sort of thing, but everything else is done by hand and with great detail. Even if you pick up the screws, like I was telling when we were installing, I was telling Dame, like, man, this, this tiny screw weighs like a half a pound. Like they're really nice <laughs> screws. Like they use quality uh, materials and all the switches are sealed. So I uh, knock on wood, I'll never have to re switch it. It's not going to need a service till I'm retired. You know, <laughs> if then, I think it's got a ways to go. So um, it just sounds unlike anything I've ever heard. There, there's nothing I've, I've heard that sounds like this board. Uh, and it's got some modern accoutrements, i.e. all the lighting and everything that comes on to tell you when something's in solo and channel on here. I, I love that. It's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, so it's the original A-range circuit on the preamp, which is a dual class A. Uh, transistor circuit and the EQ is also the same as the original A ranges with the exception of the mid range. So in oh. the sixties and seventies, there was no mid range. There was top and bottom, <laughs> right? That's all you had. So all those early, early Pop Elton and records. classical. Ta yeah, exactly. From Abbey road. Yep. And so the top, the neat thing about it is also that it's got attenuation as well as a boost, like a pull tech. Yep. And the, each one of these channels, the, the top and the low end, have these enormous inductors on them. And you can't get it to sound bad, much like a Pultec or a, or a, a Lang EQ. But the mid-range is a nice touch. I don't know how you can make a console without mid-range. So they they went back and designed the, the mid-range based on the original design of the top and the low. Absolutely gorgeous. And it has 
you know, modern routing and uh, pre post EQ inserts, all the things you want. And, you know, at mixed down, you know, this console is s- s- smaller than my API, but at mixed down, it's 56 inputs. So, so speaking of your API, which was here, which was also gorgeous. Yeah. Were you able to rescue any of it after the fire? Yes. Well, some of the EQs are, are still here. Okay. So these are all on the board, but this is what survived. Not everything, but, but much of it. As far as the, the console itself, it was pretty much a loss. So everything underneath the console, like the wiring and all the connections, got toasted. Um, it's such a shame. Yeah. You know, and, it, and I, I could have chosen to restore it, but it just would have taken you know, four or five years, I'm sure, just to restore and redo all the wiring on the console. And the expense must have been enormous. Enormous, yeah. And so we ended up, we were able to save some of the channels and get enough to make a couple racks of outboard API preamps. So we have some of the original 2520s and, and Jensen transformers and the API transformers. And so we will eventually have those made and we'll have uh, about 20 channels of those. Incredible. Yeah. No, well, I'm glad that you were able to save, you know, that much and still have yeah. some AP. And look, that's, that's a, what is that? Those 12 a piece? Yeah, 20, actually. That's 20, sorry. Yeah, they're 10s, yeah. Tens. yeah. So yeah. 20, 20, yeah, 20 channels of API EQs, yeah. and a, a nice uh, a nice thing to have, but it's such a shame of the fire damage. But you've done yeah. an amazing job because really you've returned it to what it was. It just... Yeah. Which is great because yeah. the, obviously this was the producer's workshop, yeah. which uh, for those people who don't know, um, I suppose probably most famously was where they finished up the wall, they they mixed it, they did final overdubs. Did they track um, drums in here? Mother. They did mother in mother here because yeah. Nick Mason was not here. He was in England. Um, so yeah, they did m- much of the overdubs, vocals, you know, the... And those were Jeff Beccaro, wasn't it? Jeff Beccaro. You know, the stories about the Beach Boys being on the wall, you know, any of that kind of stuff happened here. Steely Dan also did a large portion of tracking for Asia here right. um, with Bill Schnee. Name your favorite drummers. They were in here working on those albums. And Gaucho also. We found out that much of Gaucho apparently was making the uh, the Wendell drum machine. <laughs> oh. So I think they recorded quite a few of the samples here when they were making the Wendell. That makes sense. You know. Two incredible records. Absolutely. Gaucho and Asia, absolutely incredible. So you were able to save a lot of the outboard, which is great, I can tell. Um, Of course, you've got Eric's Unfair Child. Yes. Which we all know and love. I mean, that's ridiculously good sounding. Let's go down everything. So I remember these two from before, but I didn't know of them before. Yeah. Uh, Those are a local... A builder called Highland Dynamics, Bryce Gonzalez. They're some of my favorite compressors in the world. They're a really unique Verimu tube compressor, kind of halfway between a BA6A and a Gates and uh, and like a RS124, like a British Alltech mod. You know, so there's a lot of different options. You've got different input impedances, and then you've got different feedback, and a lot of those are kind of a large part of the sound of those different very mu uh, compressors. Um, I see. So you have the American and British switch. Right. Yeah. Takes you right there. But these are incredible. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, guys that use those on their mix buses, and I, I love them on vocals, bass, anything really, uh, anything that needs or wants to to feel hefty. Um, those will do it. These retro uh, 176s are absolutely superb. I, I, I'm sure yeah. the last time I was here I said this, but I remember using them to mix bass, yeah. Tom Hamilton's bass. And you just kind of come up here and you find this sweet spot where the low end's just starting to really breathe with the kick and it's gorgeous. Yeah. So you can just let that through and then compress everything above it, which I was surprised at at the time. But then I, I, did, do you think they, they increased the attack and release time to make it a little bit more modern? I think so, and and I actually enjoy doing the pull because I think, if I'm not mistaken, when you pull it, it's it's uh, similar to the original. Oh, uh, okay. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's it's quicker than a real 176, in, in my opinion, for sure. Marvison and LA2A, of course. Yep, an old late 60s LA2A. Um, which Jeez, it's well, pro- probably worth more than you and me. It, it is now, it's yeah. So expensive, haven't they? Yeah, 
and it we we had it it was in the fire and we had it completely restored um which is a miracle the la 3as we have are still in question but you know this is kind of we're back but there's still a couple pieces that will come back once once they've been completely finished and of course three of wade and yep. Abbey Road's beautiful machines there. Got the 124s, you mentioned that before. Two of those and a Red 47. Yep, and we have two Red 47s. But you can tell if you look really close, you can see which one of these two were in the fire and this one wasn't. <laughs> right. You can see these are just a little bit more brown. Right. Um, and th these are, oh my God, these are just incredible. And Wade's such a lovely fellow. He is. We had such a blast going to visit him. Oh, yeah. And then TG1, of course. Yep, TG1, which is... Still got the the nice dark knobs on it from from the fire, but it, it looks pretty awesome and it uh, amazingly still works even after it was in plus six seven hundred degree heat. Jesus, Jesus. Well, there's there's a good uh, indication of build quality when it comes to Wade's stuff. Yeah, amazing. And uh, are these are these kit eleven seventy six? These are kits, but we have two Yuris, which are uh, were also in the fire. So these are actually placeholders until our Yuris are restored. Right. So we have a couple revision um, Fs that will live there. Got some effects, PCM 90. Yeah, we have a couple PCMs around. Um, those were also in the fire. Everything here pretty much was. Um, you can see the Allen Smart has <laughs> got a nice color to it on the knobs. Um, but the PCM 90, which is one of the best drum reverbs I've ever heard. You know, it's essentially... a a piece of the of the 480 and, 480 right you know and then uh, 2500 2500 Paul Wolf design yep an original that's an old that's the Paul Wolf era it has the blue op amps and it's incredible we love Paul germanium yep yep germanium by Chandler again absolutely phenomenal it, it's just incredible i love it and a bae pre post fire and pre fire yeah. or ju during fire pre fire and post fire yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah, you can see the difference. You can see if you want to go through my uh, uh, expensive uh, aging process, uh, this, that's how it'll come out. You're like, you want to be a bit smoky. I just want to be a bit more smoky. Yeah. These jokes are getting bad. Yeah. You can tell I'm a dad. Yeah, They're the awful. smoky ones sound We're both better. dads. Yep. <laughs> and then an SDE 1000. Yeah, we use that for the plate pre-delay. Oh, okay, great, yeah. great. And we've already talked about the extensive API EQs. You know, you can't go past Steve Jackson and no. his beautiful Poltex. And these are mastering ones? These are mastering ones. and, and, and Fully recallable? Yeah. And one thing that's incredible about these, that if you're going to go buy a Poltec, let me just tell you this. These were, yeah, 70, which is pretty this is, awesome. This is the crystal algae one. That's the one, yeah. I, I, lots of people ask me about how he gets his mixes so loud. And yeah. having worked with him a couple of times, I noticed that his Poltecs are the 70, not the 60s. Yes. So he's pushing his low end there. And I know it might sound really silly for people to think that 10 hertz makes a difference. It does. It, it makes does. so much difference in volume. Yeah. The amount of energy. So if you're boosting 70 rather than 60, you can just get that mix yeah. a little bit punchier. Absolutely. And so these were really toasted. The wax, the beeswax had melted out of the pot, potted, uh, you know, on the back there was, there was, after the fire, there was beeswax on everything. And we sent them to Steve and he put them on his bench before he did anything. And they were still a matched pair, so their their fire their Poltex are made just like they were originally, like tanks. They're fireproof. Well, you know, as as I'm sure has been said many times, Steve and Gene, the owner and designer of Poltex, were friends. Yeah, he got the schematics, he got the blessing, he got even uh, the same deal that they had with API to use the op amps. Op amps. You know? So you know. Pretty amazing. Uh, these are these are Poltex. They're Poltex. Yeah. They're Poltex. Absolutely. I'm such a sweet guy. He's the best. Yeah, we love him. He, he was a great help with me after the fire with the API. He also is an API nut, like many right. of us. And He's been restoring his own console now for about seven years, isn't it, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> we were joking about it at the show. <laughs> it's like a life's passion. While he's still hand-building these, I know. he's trying to yeah also build a console. Absolutely. And he helped me out too. We ended up selling him some parts for, for his board that he better finish. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Steve? You heard it here first. Because I want to come to Colorado and bring my family on holiday and go mix at his studio. That sounds like a really good idea to me. <laughs> so unfair, child? It's uh, unfair <laughs> how, how great it is. In a world of many fair childs, especially since last weekend, 
a couple more came on the block. Two uh, more. I know this is the Telefunken one. So what's the other one? Audioscape. Oh, Audioscape have got one as well. Ah. You know, and... Uh, we want to do the great shootout. I know. We should do them. We should do all of them. Like we need here. to get them all and do all of them. I, I think that would... Yes. Okay. Okay, everybody. That's what we want to do. So we just need to get them all. <laughs> UTA? UTA, yes. Yeah, so that's the, the accessory box, which makes this thing so much more usable than even any Fairchild plug-in because you have a mixed dry, you've got your side chain, you've got yeah. the feedback feed forward where you can turn this thing into a VCA with tubes and you've got an output trim, which is really nice, especially if you don't want to run the threshold too hot. You can kill your gain or push your gain super high and trim the output down. And then you also have these great controls where you can, how, how the side chain is affected. If you want it to be an average or a mid-side, or you can do individual. You know, I always, always would say in video, especially, you know, we first started off that 10 years ago, nine and a half, 10 years ago, um, that I thought the best modern engineer, I'm a huge Ciccarelli fan, I'm a huge fan of all the obvious guys, and Emmerich, yeah. and of course Jack, and Shelley, and all those guys. Yes. Eric, to me, was like the best of all the modern guys. Yep. So when he bought this out, I knew it was going to be just like this. It was yep. designed by engineers yes. for the purpose. It is. I knew it was going to kill it. And that's one of the things I was just telling a mutual friend the other day that also makes microphones is that I can pick up the phone and call these people. Yeah. And Brad, of course, another great engineer. Yeah, Brad. Yeah. And say, you know, I want this or I want it to do this or I'm, and that, that is such a big deal that I can call someone and have a conversation about something that they made. And that's really important to me as a producer in a studio. And I always tell people, if you want to buy something, buy something. It's a yep. personal thing when you spend this, you know, a, a large sum of money on something like a compressor or an EQ. So yeah, so a pair of 160s and a pair of 165s. Yes. Absolutely gorgeous. 160, DBX 160 is the most underrated vocal compressor ever. Not for me. I use it all the time. There you go. Uh, my, my chain is 160 into 1176. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's so so underrated I, I you know everybody wants to go put it on something that's got lots of transients and you know like a you know a drum buzz which is great but god it handles a vocal so well it does it's amazing and then you put 1176 on like 20 to 1 to just catch the occasional yep. peaks you've got the best vocal sound ever absolutely wonderful so um do you still have a tape machine here the tape machine did not survive oh i'm sorry yeah. if we if people are beating down the door to do tape sessions, we'll, we'll put one in here. Right. Uh, we have all the wiring for it, so hopefully people beat down the door for tape sessions. One I, would hope. I would love to have a tape machine back in here. So, uh, de rigueur pair of NS10s for those that still do. Yes. Um, but of course, the Atomics. The Atomics are incredible. This is my second pair, and I fell in love with these right after the fire, actually, and, and I built myself a mix room in North Hollywood to keep working. And I ended up buying a pair of Atomics because we had no monitors after the fire. Everything, my NS10s were in storage, so those stayed. And uh, I had to rebuy everything. So I said, you know, I'm going to buy something I've always kind of wanted to check out. And that was Atomics because I love the way they look, but also people I really respect and love use them. Yep. And they kind of do a thing that's maybe not so unique to, to new speaker makers these days, where I think a lot of speakers, especially mid midfield stuff and the bigger stuff people are cleaning things up quite a bit and making them a little more sterile when with the bigger speakers and these have a really healthy mid-range which i like especially in a tracking room uh when you're trying to kind of listen for things to try to you know make things work together and they're three-way speakers they have an active bass in the back and they have a tweeter and a mid-range and they just sound incredible they just sound like rock and roll what I love about them is honestly how they sound, number one, but secondly, how they look. They, yeah. they look like they came out of a 50s recording studio. Yes. They've exactly. got that just kind of function for, uh, over anything else, just like speakers, yeah. box, speaker, you know. It, and to be honest, it looks absolutely perfect on this console. It does. And they weigh a 78 pounds a piece. I was about to say they look like they weigh a ton. Yeah, they, they really sound yeah. phenomenal. The whole, yeah, you move the speaker, everything else moves with it. Yeah, yeah. We're still in the progress of finishing the control room, so that's going to be black, our bridge. We actually put the bridge up for our open house. But that's gonna, oh, okay. And then we're going to have our patch bays matching the console, which will be in the next couple of weeks. You're going to go to GPO style, or are you well, going to keep them as TTs? 
No, no, it'll be TTs. <laughs> we don't, yeah, we don't, that, that'll be, I don't know if I have the room to store those things. Those yeah. Big. Yeah, yeah, huge. But that was always the BBC job. There's always some intern or assistant there keeping them clean with Brasso. <laughs> yeah. So they're all absolutely. Yeah. Well, firstly, before we move in here, we have uh, Lukey standing in the corner, see if you can get him there. <laughs> Who thought he was getting out of the way, but now he's right in the shop, but it's quite all right. No, I scared him. <laughs> um, so, wait a minute, does that go out to the back? Is that a loading in area? Yeah. I never knew that. Yeah, that's a side loading uh, we nice. use for sometimes for film shoots or pianos, that kind of thing. Right, but Sunset is there. Uh, right straight south of it, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's south facing. That's going straight out towards the boulevard, yeah. All right, so sorry, Hollywood Boulevard's there, yeah? Yeah. That is, so that's right at the front. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was a little turned around. So that's great. So you can actually load in on the front, on the front street. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Absolutely. Nice. And so this is this is like a, a, an ISO hall. We use it for amps, and um, we also have a, a second piano so that we can do isolated vocal with piano if we have a tracking session. And we can isolate, you know, two or three amps in here at a time. And we have tie lines to everything. Um, and it's actually a, a pretty awesome little drum room too. It's look at this. Yeah, the old AC thirty. Yeah, JMI. JMI. It's gorgeous, and a Princeton, of course. Yes. That's really nice. What year is the Princeton? Sixty six. Oh, okay. It gets used more than anything I own. Nice. Very very <laughs> nice. Gorgeous. Um, absolutely lovely Yamaha upright. Yes. Um, but you have. A grand piano that uh, I'm very envious of. Uh, yes. The Beckstein, of course. Or a Beckstein, Beckstein, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Right. <sighs> What's the history of this piano? It's a, it was bought in Harrods. It's bought in Harrods? There's a sticker. I could play. <laughs> yeah. So it's bought in Harrods and then shipped. Oh, there it is. Yeah. And then shipped here. Well, it was. It's a 1917, and the it was the second owner. I bought it from who lives here, and his dad bought it at Harrods in the late 60s, and it is very much. It's almost identical to the one that was at Trident. So right. the Trident rock piano for the first Elton and, and uh, Bowie records and some early Queen. Was Hunky Dory done at Trident? Yes. So they were in the Beckstein then? It was, yes, it was a Beckstein, yeah. Nice. And that, that piano was in 1890s and this was in 1917, so you know, about 20 years later. But same size, it was not a concert grand, it was a studio grand. So I've been looking for a pian the original piano for this room, which was a Baldwin ever since I took it over, and I just found the Beckstein and, and fell in love with it. on the bright thing on National Bright Day. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. It's gorgeous sounding. And then it has this, the swell, which is my favorite.
That's a lot of fun. Yeah. So you just got this? Yeah. Gorgeous. I forgot about the Strat. It's really nice. Plays beautifully. So great. This uh, this little Morgan sounds gorgeous. Yeah, it, it's. I'm, I'm a Vox nerd, and and I, it's like a modern Vox. So it's got the kind of the sound of an old Vox, but it's got the kind of the modern sensitivities to a right. boutique amp, and it's got an attenuator on the output, so you can. You don't have to have. You can pull it all way down to like I think a half a watt. On the output, that's amazing. What do we have it set on? I think it was yeah. It's probably three about three quarters up. Three quarters up. And what is it? Is it a thirty watt or fifteen? Oh, fifteen. Yeah. So so it's like an AC fifteen. Yeah, but it, and it's got the EF eighty six. You know the Hank Marvin circuit, and it's got the regular twelve AX seven. Oh yeah, I see. We were in the EF eighty six. Yeah. You can blend them or, and they don't have EQ. They have switches, so they have switches that kind of determine the tone, and you can. It's really unique. I'm, his amps are incredible. Gorgeous sounding, gorgeous looking. And some pedals here? Yeah, a couple. That's like my Gilmore board. <laughs> what is the Caprid? That's a uh, Ram's Head uh, Big Muff copy. Ah, oh, I see. I should have gone with Big Muff looking at, looking at the uh, the layout of it. And then you have an Ecorec emulation. Ca- yeah, the Caitlin bread, which is great, but it's not the real one. The real one's pretty insane. Uh, absolutely. Analog man. Yeah, fuzz face, his sun face, which I love. And the banana boost. Yeah, that's that's a copy of the Sola Sound um, boost that was uh, popular in the mid 60s. And it's got a kind of a fuzz and a it's transistor based. So if you drive it enough, it, it gets fuzzy and or you can do it, you can clean it up. And then the Moon Vibe, which is a phenomenal Univibe uh, that's, uh, that's made by Electronic Orange. And it's a copy of a 60s Univibe, but with a couple of extra options. Beautiful. A bass man? Yeah, 63, blonde. Best bassman I've ever heard, in my opinion. Just uh, other The tweed bassmans are also great, but when they started putting them in heads, I, this is just a fantastic. This is a Beatle amp, like not literally, but this was an amp that the Beatles used in the studio a lot. And it has more headroom than a black face or a silver face, but it just it's just a great rock and roll amp. That looks awesome. Yeah. Your Ringo kit, what's, uh, what year is this? Uh, it's a 59. You should be sitting down here because I'm a terrible drummer. No, I'm not. You're yeah. significantly better than me. So, <laughs> so it's a 59. <laughs> Yeah, it's a 59, um, it's rewrapped, but it's 59 transitional badge, mahogany. So it, it's not the later maple stuff, it's the early, earlier, uh, you know, mahogany, I think poplar mahogany, something like that. Um, but it survived the fire, luckily it was put away. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is our house kit. So if you come to record here, you have the option to use this great kit. And so some very old Zildjian's here. Very old Zildjian symbols, which you cannot use if you come here because they break. Oh, I see. <laughs> but I have them up. What um, is this? That's actually a, the Take 5 ride that was done by Memphis Drum Shop. So it's a very short run of 20-inch A's that uh, Zildjian did. Uh, I, d- I didn't recognize it at all. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's a. Oh, yeah. You know, they made it like they make their old ones, which I wish they'd do a whole line like this, but they, but this was it. Fantastic. Another basement. Another basement, yes. Is this late 60s? Yeah. Yeah, that's a 68. So it's, it's a what they call a drip. So when you have the, the little. Uh, perimeter here that they're called drips. So the silver faces that have this are black face circuit. So it's the AB763 circuit. And this is, you know, McCartney, let it be Abbey Road bass amp. Wonderful. With a matching cab with two uh, 15 inch JBLs. Two 15 inch. Yeah. Yowza. I don't know what this is. What is, um, what is magic? He was a local builder. He's still around, but he doesn't build amps in a while. Um, but he made 
all sorts of tweed Fender amps. And I, the first time I heard that amp was on a session about four years ago. It's one of the best recording amps I've ever heard in my life. He builds them all by hand, custom transformers. Everything in it is done completely to his specs. And I literally bought it a year ago off the guy that, I, that used it here four years ago. And I sold my other deluxe. Um, and it's, it's incredible. Lovely. If you want, save a reverb search on Magic Amps. He made some of the best amps I've ever heard as far as boutique Fender types go. I think before we go on and finish up the last couple of things here, I think we have to really give Clay a shout out for preserving the look of this room because it's so beautiful. It's so classic LA studio. Yeah. He did an amazing job of like maintaining it and are all these tiles new or just repainted? Everything in this room was, has been replaced except for the door on the booth. Really? So Nyback builds, Josh Nyback and his team. It looks identical. I know. But, but brand new. But brand new. We rebuilt it with photos and, and my memory. And Amazing. They were able to, it, it sounds the same. The room sounds the same. I it's, can't imagine how much this cost to do. They took these designs that were made for the room in the late 70s, mid 70s, and, you know, we didn't change them a whole lot, but we improved them where we could, like with materials. And after they started the rebuild, there was probably, you know, between five and 20 people in here every day for almost a year. And after they finished most of it, I finally put a drum kit up and just listened to the room. I was here by myself and I could not believe that it sounded exactly the same. That was, that was what I was worried about, but I was okay with you know, moving forward and saying the meticulous attention to detail is, yeah. is it's outstanding. Yeah. Astounding. And Amazing. we did a couple of things like with the lighting, we made a couple light boxes, which were pretty popular in the late sixties. And, you know, back in the late sixties, these would have been fluorescent. So we ended up putting um, a hue light system through the whole facility. So everything can be controlled with an app. Yeah, we saw that at your, uh, your 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 opening event. It was amazing. Oh, you've done an incredible job. Thank you. And then all the way down to the detail of shag pile carpeting in the uh, in the booth here. Love this. Let's bring back the late sixties and early seventies. Look at that. So these, we had a when I first moved in this this studio in twenty ten. This carpet was here. And we had replaced it a couple times over the years from roof leaks, that kind of thing. I could never find it. And so when we rebuilt the booth, uh, we ended up buying the flooring at a store called Linoleum City, which is where a lot of uh, film trucks you'll find all the time because I'll go there and buy weird stuff for the film sets. The fact that there is still a store yeah. in 2024 called, called Linoleum City. Linoleum is, City. Is absolutely outstanding. <laughs> yeah. And so they... We were looking for just was some this brown new shag. old stock just sitting in the back. This was new old stock. New old stock. <laughs> and this fifty is, year old carpet. It is. This is the same stuff that was in here when I moved in here. On, <sighs> so cool. Fourteen years ago. It's basically Chewbacca, isn't it? It's like Chewbacca on the walls. It is, and then you got Oscar the Grouch here. So it's <laughs> you know, so cool. We went for the you know the the seventies colors, which. You can't beat in this room. Well, when I came in here earlier, I was thinking you could just put like a little day bed up in here. It's just so calm in here. You walk in. It here. is. If Eric comes in, well, you can obviously hear from the mics here. It's just nice and dead. And and the singer has their own AC. So what else could you ask for? You could keep your singer in here for the whole record if you want. Yeah, maybe they'll just put a little day bed in and off you go. Yeah. Now, here's my guitar that I lent you. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wish. Oh, this is so gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. What year is this again? Uh, it's one of their VOS 64 reissues that they're doing. Oh, they've done an amazing job. I never would have guessed this is a reissue. Yeah. So is it a custom shop or just off the shelf? It's a custom shop. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the custom shop that they do without all the extras. So it's the baseline custom. Without the... the 
you know, what do they call that? Oh, the relic, yeah, no. Yeah, the relic, yeah. This is gorgeous. Oh. So 64 reissue. Yeah. I love that guitar. I, I love it. I, I actually, the first time I played it, I thought it was just the 64 in perfect condition. <laughs> That's how believable it is. It yeah. did an amazing job. It is. What do you got there? This is a water slide, which is made by a local guitar player. And it's kind of a take on the lap steel strat, um, unofficially cooter caster, but a lot of people have developed them over the years into different types of guitars. Yeah. So just really well made and it's such a great guitar for a studio because when you slide, you can't beat it with the big lap steel pickup. That's gorgeous. I love it. And you've got the Hofner there. Yeah. This. What year is this? 67. 67. Lovely. It's in gorgeous condition. Yes. Uh, here. Oh, there's a weight to this. Is this 70s? No, it's a new Fender that it's their 60. That's like a 62 reissue, I think they did. I was thinking of like those 74, 75s, like Dan Rothschild has one. And it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so oh, heavy. yeah. No, it's light. Great. And then a Martin? Yeah, that's. Um, oh, this is light. Yeah, that's actually a buddy of mine's model. It's a Kenneth Paddingale, so it's a 0015 with an aged top. So instead of mahogany top, I believe it's a, a Sitka spruce top that they sent through their aging process. So he really likes 50s uh, Martins and he wanted to emulate that so that he could take one out maybe and not, you know. Not take trash it, it. Exactly. And it's one of my favorite guitars I own. What's it called? It's a Kenneth Pattengale. Uh, 0015. Really lovely. Yeah. Yeah. It's so light. It is, yeah. So it has that feeling of a guitar that's, you know, 50 years old, that's aged and all the moisture's starting to leave, so it's super yeah. light. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, I can't remember what the process is called, but it, it, they basically take the top and they dehydrate it or freeze it and, and right. make it uh, kind of what happens to wood over 60 years. And well, they did an incredible job. They really did. It feels beautiful to play and sounds amazing. And yeah, yeah, the, the weight, it just feels like a, a vintage guitar. If somebody handed that to you blindfold, you'd be like, oh, yeah, this is like a 1950. Like, nope. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. And then the last but no means least, an SG. An SG. That's just a 62 reissue that I, that it, it's, it's a studio guitar that is always here. I don't have everything here, but that's one that always stays. It's just a great, great way to. These are wonderful. Put I went to see Tedeschi Trucks a few times when we were in Boston, and I got to talk to um, Derek Trucks. Oh. And he said that uh, his 62s were just off the shelf. Yeah. He just went in, picked up a couple, played them, find the one couple he liked, and that's it. Yeah. And I, I love that. You know, I love hearing that. that uh, you know, they still make guitars the way they're supposed to be made. It's incredible. So last but no means least, we have a beautiful Hammond. This was here before, yes? Yes. Okay. Phew. Yeah, it survived. I recognized it. Yeah, this room for the most part in the fire had a lot of smoke damage, but luckily all the, the you know, the larger things that were in here, the piano, the B3, you know, we had to clean them up a bit, but um, they weren't ruined by any means. So uh, this is our B3 that we've had in, a, in our 122. And it's been on a lot of records. It's one of the best B3s I've ever heard. And I think if you got a studio and you're a tracking room, you got to have a Hammond. Got to have a Hammond, got to have a piano. Incredible. Yeah. Well, Clay, thank you ever so much for showing us around. Congratulations on getting it open. Thank you so much. Restoring it to its, its, its beauty and obviously getting that nice brand new old console. Is that the way of explaining it? Yes, the brand new old console. Brand new old console. Thanks, everyone. There will, of course, be a link to Clay Studio, to Boulevard Recording down below. So please leave any comments and questions below. Thank you ever so much for watching. Um, please check out Clay's studio online and, I don't know, book it. It's phenomenal. We've recorded here. He's done courses here with us as well, so you can check those out as well. Thanks, everyone. So long, farewell. Avidisayan, au revoir, adios, ciao, goodbye.